The Dragon Slayer. Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a land far, far away, a village small, small, so very small, had finished their harvest and began to celebrate a celebratory celebration. There was music and there was dancing. A boy named Albert was the strongest and most handsome in the village, and the girls stood in line to dance with him. But late in the evening, a new girl caught his eye. What's your name? I am Lucy. You're not from around here, are you? No. Where are you from? From somewhere else. One of them clearly wasn't too bright, but they danced every dance without resting for the rest of the night, and they fell in love. So maybe it was both of them. But suddenly, there was a loud thundering of horses' hooves outside. I, I must leave. No, stay. The music is still playing. Let's dance. Suddenly, all the doors in the room were kicked open at once, and the king's soldiers rushed toward Albert and Lucy with swords and spears. Then, everyone in the room bowed down. What's going on? Take your hands off of my daughter. The soldiers pulled Albert away from Lucy and threw him to the floor. Then they pointed their swords and spears at his face. Father, please don't hurt him. Albert was confused. King George is your father? King George didn't let Lucy answer. He pointed his finger at Albert's nose and shouted, "You stay away from my daughter." But I want to marry her. Do you think I would let a farmer marry my daughter? Why not? I love her and she loves me. Silly boy, a princess can't marry a common village boy. A princess may only marry a nobleman or a knight or a really rich man. Then King George grabbed Lucy by the arm and pulled her toward the door. Your Majesty, if I become rich, may I have your daughter's hand in marriage? King George stopped and turned. He stroked his chin and smiled and said, "I tell you what, there are heaps of gold and jewels in the treasury at the old castle. If you go there and return the crown jewels to me, you may keep the rest of the gold and jewels, and you may marry my daughter. That's what I'll do then. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see." Then King George and the princess left and rode away. The room was so quiet, you could hear a pin drop. All eyes turned toward Albert. Why is everyone looking at me? Do you realize what you just said? What? Do you know why King George abandoned the old palace? Why? Because a dragon built his nest there. A dragon? <clears throat> Why would King George send me after the royal treasure if he knew a dragon was living there? <laughs> Because he doesn't want you to marry his daughter. He wants the dragon to breathe fire upon you. Albert walked toward the door. No, I don't care. I love Lucy, and I'm going to do everything I can to marry her, even if it kills me. Maybe Albert was the one who wasn't too bright, but he sure was determined. The next day, Albert started toward the old palace. Then he found out that just getting there was not going to be easy. It was a hundred miles away, with dangerous icy rivers along the way. I must go on, even if I didn't bring winter clothes. By the time he crawled the snow-covered rivers, he was freezing to death. Yep, Albert's not too bright. As he began crossing the other side of the river, he fell. And his body rolled and rolled and rolled down the riverside. He was knocked out by the fall. He didn't wake up until he rolled into an ice cold river. When Albert was sure he would drown or freeze to death, the icy river emptied into an even faster moving river. Oh no! I lost the sword I brought to slay the dragon. Now I'll be defenseless against the dragon. After a few minutes, he was able to swim and stay afloat. He swam to the other side of the river and hauled himself up onto shore water. Now I can see the, 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 the high stone walls of the castle. 
He also saw patches of the green grass that had been blackened by the fiery breath of the dragon. Suddenly, Albert heard the loud thumping and swishing of the dragon's huge wings. I must find cover in a hollow log. The hollow log caught fire, but Albert was unharmed. At least he was getting warm again. (sighs) I'll have to wait here until the sounds of the dragon's wings fade away. Then he crawled out of the hollow log and watched it burn as he thought and thought of a way to get by the dragon and get to the treasure without being burnt to a crisp. I must find out where the dragon's nest is. Wait, what is that over there? It's the treasury, where King George's treasure is stored. Next, Albert borrowed a scarecrow from a nearby cornfield. In the darkest part of the night, he sneaked the scarecrow inside the palace and up to the top of the wall opposite the treasury, in plain sight of the dragon. What's this? A barrel. I will cut the top off the barrel and sneak it up as close to the dragon as possible. Then he climbed into the barrel and fell asleep. The next morning, he was awakened by the loud thumping. As expected, when the dragon awoke, he thought the scarecrow on the palace wall was a man. He flew toward the scarecrow. (laughs) Now that the dragon is not watching me, I will quickly climb out of the barrel and carry it to the treasury. He carried the barrel inside the treasury just as the scarecrow was burning to a cinder. Then he stepped out of the treasury and shouted, Hey, dragon! Over here! Come and get me! Hearing that, the dragon turned and flew at top speed toward the treasury as Albert dove out of sight. When the dragon landed and poked his head through the treasury doors, Albert covered the dragon's head with the barrel. When the dragon breathed fire, the barrel directed the fire at the dragon himself, and the dragon burned himself to a crisp. (laughs) I can't believe that worked. I will return home and ask King George if I can marry Princess Lucy. He reached the King George's courtroom and signaled his servants to bring in a wooden treasure box. Albert showed the crown jewels to the king. I slew the dragon, and now I'm a very rich man. At that moment, Princess Lucy entered the room and hugged Albert. Thank you for what you did for me. So even though he wasn't too bright, Albert got to marry the girl he loved, and he got a load of treasure and the old castle too. And they all lived happily ever after. The Talking Magical Box Once upon a time, there was a young traveler who wandered here and there and all around the globe because he liked to see so many different countries. One day, as he was walking along, he picked up a box. He opened it, and the magic box said to him, What do you want? He was very much frightened, but instead of throwing the box away, he only shut it tight and put it in his pocket. Then he traveled on, further and further. As he went, he said to himself, Hmm, if it says to me again, what do you want? I shall know better what to say this time. So he took out the magic box and opened it. And again it asked, What do you want? My hat to be filled with gold. And instantly, the hat was full of gold coins. So now he won't need anything. So, on he traveled, away, 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 through the thick forests, till at last he came to a beautiful castle. In the castle there lived a king. The young man walked round and round the castle till the king noticed him and asked what he was doing there. I was just looking at your castle. You would like to have one like it, wouldn't you? The young man did not reply, but when the sun set and night came, he took his magic box and opened the lid. What do you want? Build me a castle with walls of gold and tiles of diamond and the furniture of uh, silver and gold. 
He had barely finished speaking when there stood in front of him, exactly opposite the king's palace, a castle built precisely as he had ordered. When the king awoke, he was amazed at the sight of the magnificent palace shining in the rays of the sun. So the king went to see the young man, and he told him plainly that he was a very powerful king, and that if he hoped that they might all live together in one house or the other, and that the king would give him his daughter to wife. So it all turned out just as the king had asked. The young man married the princess, and they lived happily in the palace of gold. But the king's wife was jealous of the young man and her daughter. The princess had told her mother about the magic box, which gave them everything they wanted, and the queen bribed a servant to steal the magic box. The servant watched carefully where it was put away every night and waited for the perfect evening to try and steal it. And on one dark night, as the whole world was asleep, the servant stole the box and brought it to her old mistress. The queen opened the lid, and the magic box said to her, What do you want? I want you to take me and my husband and my servants and this beautiful house and set us down on the other side of the Red Sea, but leave my daughter and her husband behind. When the young couple woke up, they found themselves back in the old castle, and the magic box was gone. The young man mounted his horse right away and filled his pockets with as much gold as he could carry. He searched all the neighboring countries one by one, looking in vain for the magic box. But soon, his money ran out. But still, he pressed on as fast as the strength of his horse would let him. Someone told him that he must consult the monster, for the monster traveled far and might be able to tell him something. So he traveled far and sought out the land of the monster. There, he found an old woman who said to him, What are you doing here? My son eats every living thing he sees. If you're smart, you'll run away and not come back. But the young man told her all his sad tale, and he said that perhaps her son, who traveled so far, might have seen a golden palace. As he spoke these last words, the monster came in and said he smelt a tasty man, so he thought it must be dinner time. But his mother told him that it was a poor traveler who lost everything and had come all this way to seek his advice. She told the young man to not be afraid, but to come forward and show himself. So he went boldly up to the monster and asked if by chance he had seen a golden palace. Yes, I had seen the golden palace and even tried to destroy it to eat the people inside. But that palace is so strong I couldn't find a way in. Oh, well do tell me where it is. It's a long way off on the other side of the Red Sea. Finally, after so many travels, the young traveler knew where to find his palace. So he set forth at once, and somehow or other, he managed to reach the distant land across the Red Sea. When he arrived, he decided to disguise himself as a gardener and walked up to the castle and asked if they needed a gardener. He was very happy when they agreed to hire him. He passed most of his days gossiping with the servants about the wealth of their masters and the wonderful things in the house. He made friends with one of the maids, who told him the history of the magic box, and he asked her to let him see it. One evening, she managed to get a hold of it and show him, and the young man watched carefully where she hid it away, in a secret place in the bedchamber of her mistress. The next night, when everyone was fast asleep, he crept in and took the magic box. Think of his joy as he opened the lid. It asked him, What do you want? 
I want to go with my palace to the old place, and for the king and queen and all their servants to be drowned in the Red Sea. He hardly finished speaking when he found himself back again with his wife, while all the other inhabitants of the palace were lying at the bottom of the Red Sea. The End The Magical Wishing Pond Once upon a time, there was a little princess named Jasmine. She was her father's only child, and she was spoiled. She was very stubborn and very selfish. She was always hungry for delicious food. One day, a magician visited the king to give him blessings and to warn him about a magical wishing pond within his dynasty. O oh, king, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, about a wishing pond in your state, which is... At the same time, little Jasmine was passing by the courtroom and she saw the magician talking to her father. She got excited when she heard about the magical wishing pond. As soon as she heard about a magical wishing pond, she ran to her room without staying to listen to the magician's full sentence. I must go to the magical wishing pond to ask for delicious food. The next day morning, Jasmine hurriedly got ready and started her journey towards the pond. At noon, she reached it with few gold coins in her pocket. She wanted to wish for many things, like a delicious cake, ice cream, hamburger, pizza, crispy turkey, chocolates, cookies, and many more. But when she read the warning sign at the pond, she was disappointed. It said, one wish per person. Magic pond, magic pond, give me a wish. Grant me a food pot, which will give me a treat. Suddenly, a magical pot came up from the pond, following a whisper. Here is your wish. What you ask for, follow my instructions, or it will work not. You have to say three magical words. Ting, tong, twang. Then the magical pot will begin making delicious food. It will fulfill your hungriest desires. But do not forget to say stop, pot, stop, or else it will make food non-stop. Okay, whatever. Jasmine came back to her palace. She was very curious about the magical pot and mumbled the magical words. Ting tong twain, I want chocolate cake and cocoa pudding. Magically, the pot started making a fountain of chocolate pudding and cake. Jasmine dove in and ate as though she were starving. Days and days passed as she asked for her every kind of food she could think of. She started to gain lots of weight. One day, King visited her. He saw a fat kid eating a chicken leg and he came near. He didn't realize it was his daughter until he came closer. He was surprised and said, Oh, my, my dear princess, what have you done to yourself? Father, I visited a magical wishing pond a few days earlier and asked for a magic food pot. Now, for the last few days, I've been making wishes for food. And last night, I forgot the magical words to stop the pot. The king realized how selfish and greedy she was. And he held the crying princess in his arms and said, Dear princess, you never listen to anyone. I know you heard that magician talk about the magical wishing pond, but you must not have listened to everything he said. Oh, king, I came here to give you an ominous warning. Ooh, a wishing pond in your state, which grants wishes, but those wishes always come with a consequence. It is an evil magical pond. I suggest you destroy it 
as soon as possible. Now you know, my dear princess, why this is happening. Then the king summoned his guards and ordered, Pick up that pot and burn it in the fire. Immediately, guards followed the instructions and they put the pot in the burning stove and watched till it melted and turned to ashes. Afterward, the princess started to do daily exercise, and soon she came into her original shape. After that, they lived happily forever. Moral of the story, never act on half-heard stories. The End The Magical Bottle Abu was a fisherman. He lived near the beach and had been fishing for as long as he could remember. When he was young, he would stay at sea all night. In the morning, he would return with a big catch of fresh fish, which he would sell at the local market. And now, Abu was almost 80 years old, and too old to go out to sea in his boat. So instead, he would throw his net out from the shore four times a day. He would eat some of the fish, and the rest he would sell for a little money. One day, he went out to the sea in the morning. He threw his net over the water. After some time, he could feel something heavy trapped in the net. He pulled and pulled and pulled, and it took all his strength to get his net up onto the shore, and found a dead donkey tangled in the net. Oh, no! He cried. All this effort for a dead donkey? What will I do? What can I eat? So he thought about old King Solomon, an ancient king who was known for his wisdom. And then the old man once more cast his net into the water, and soon he could tell he had caught something. This time the net was even heavier. With all his strength again, Abu slowly pulled up the net to shore, and inside was a barrel full of sand. Oh, no! He cried again. All of this effort for a barrel full of sand. What will I do? What can I eat? Again, he thought about King Solomon's great wisdom and decided to persevere. Abu cast his net into the water a third time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. It made a clanging sound like pots and pans banging against each other. And guess what it was? A whole bunch of old pots and pans. They were all rusted and of no use. So Abu looked to the sky and cried out, ah, Why do I deserve this? I have only the strength to cast my net four times in each day. And I've already done it three times. If I cannot catch any fish the fourth time, I'll surely die of hunger today. Why must I capture all of this junk? With his prayer on his lips, Abu threw the net one last time. This time, something even heavier got trapped in the net. Abu had to wade deep into the water to pull the net out. He saw it was a brass bottle. This time, Abu was happy. Even though he had not caught any fish, the brass bottle looked solid. Perhaps he could sell it for more gold coins and have enough food for the next month. But he saw that the bottle had lead seal on it. And looking closely, Abu realized that the seal was none other than King Solomon's. He was now very curious to know what was inside the bottle. He opened the seal with a knife. As soon as he opened it, a huge magical creature came out from the bottle. It shot out 100 feet into the sky with a huge roar. Abu was so scared he cried out in fear. The creature noticed Abu and shrunk down to just 10 feet so he could talk with Abu. Fisherman, did you free me? It thundered. Me? Uh, yes. Yes, magical creature. My name is Abu. Abu, a fine name, said the creature with a smile. 
I have been trapped in that bottle for a long time. Thank you, fisherman, Abu. Now tell me, how would you like to die? Die? But, sir, I freed you. Why would you want to kill me? I was trapped in that bottle by King Solomon, fisherman Abu. But Solomon ruled this land almost 2,000 years ago. Yes, 1,800 years ago, to be precise. I rebelled against him. So Solomon defeated me and trapped me in this bottle. Then, he had the bottle thrown into the sea. I have regretted my mistake ever since. But that means I have freed you from prison. Why do you want to kill me? For a thousand years, I wished someone would free me. I pledged that I would give that person enough wealth to last his lifetime, but no one came. Then in anger, I pledged that I would kill the man that would free me. But I would allow that man to choose the way he would die. <clears throat> so, how would you like to die, Fisherman Abu? Abu thought again of King Solomon's wisdom, and then a clever idea came to him. Sir, you claim that Solomon trapped you in that bottle? But I don't believe you. What? cried the creature, and his voice boomed like a hundred thunders. You are so tall. Your hands are like the trunk of the tree. There's no way you could have fit inside that tiny bottle. I don't care if I die, but I don't want to be killed by a liar. You puny fisherman. I may be evil and mean and make stupid promises, but I never lied a lie in my life. Then prove it, said Abu. The creature swished its hands. It turned into smoke and slowly, bit by bit, entered the bottle. And from inside it shouted, See? I can fit into this bottle. Abu quickly picked up the lead seal and trapped the creature inside the bottle again. The creature tried his best to come out, but he could not break the seal. Then the creature roared in thunder, but then calmed himself down and said sneakily, You tricked me! I give up. You're too clever for me, Abu. Now... I wish to get out of this jar, and I pledge I will give the man who freed me his youth back. Good deal, right? Come on, free me. Free me, Abu. Your prize is waiting for you. Abu listened calmly, and with a cunning smile, he said, <laughs> You think I am a fool? I have lived my life to the fullest, and I don't need anything more than that. I may be old but not foolish enough to free you again. Now, bye-bye! No, wait. Let me make another deal for you! Abu threw the bottle back into the sea and was grateful that his life was saved. The End The Magic Horse Once upon a time in Persia, at the royal palace, all the kingdom's artists, craftsmen, and strangers would present their skills to the king. If the king was pleased, he would grant them a fine gift. One day, a traveler came before the king and presented an artificial horse. Your majesty, never has such a thing ever been seen as wonderful as this. But any toy maker can make a toy horse. This is not just a toy, your majesty. On his back, I can ride through the air with the greatest of ease to the most distant part of the earth in a very short time. The man demonstrated the skills of his mechanical horse. The king was amazed and asked to purchase the horse. Oh, your majesty, I couldn't possibly sell such a valuable horse for mere money. Well then, so what do you want? I must have this horsey. The stranger thought for a moment and then offered to give him the horse. 
for free if the king would give him the hand of the princess. The king was about to agree when his son, Prince Darius, came into the room and spoke up in protest. Um, forgive me, father. Were you just about to let this guy marry my sister in exchange for a toy horse? The king, somewhat embarrassed, denied it and asked his son to examine the horse. Prince Darius approached the horse. He leapt onto the saddle and pulled the lever. In an instant, the horse rose high into the air. The king was very pleased, but suddenly realized that his son was so high he could be hurt. He ordered the guards to seize the traveler and put him to prison. Far away in the sky, Prince Darius was carried through the clouds with breathtaking speed. He tried using the lever to turn the horse off, but it did nothing. But he examined the horse further and found another lever, and when he moved it, the horse started to descend. The prince came down close to the ground. Spotting a rooftop higher than all the others, he landed the horse upon the roof of the palace. He came to some steps below. A princess had already been awakened by the sounds she had heard on the roof. She instructed her guards to bring the trespasser to her. The guards brought the prince before her, and he fell on his knees. <clears throat> Forgive me, princess, for awakening you. I am the son of a king. <clears throat> that means I'm a prince, and that's the most important thing about me. The lady was Princess Nadia, the daughter of the King of Bengal. The princess felt glad to hear all about his adventure. Over the next few days, the two of them got to know each other, and before long, they fell in love. One afternoon, the prince said to her, Ah, oh, my princess, I was thinking about our future, and I must go back to my kingdom and ask my father for permission for our marriage. Plus, he would like to know that the magical flying horse didn't smash me into the ground. Want to come? She agreed. The next morning, they went to the magical, dangerous mechanical horse. Flipping the lever, the two took off, and in 30 minutes, they had arrived at the capital of Persia. The prince first took the princess to a cottage in the woods near the palace. Stay here while I go get the toy maker out of prison before he's executed, and I'll mention to my dad that I'm not dead. Most of all, I want to tell my father about you. He'll prepare a reception to welcome a princess. Then, maybe after dessert, I'll tell him I want to marry you. He explained to her how to operate the magic horse in case she might need to flee for safety while he was away. A thief behind the bushes had heard their entire conversation. But can you blame him? They were staying in his cottage. <laughs> what luck! A princess alone and a magic horse! I'll take her to the Sultan of Kashmir, I'll get a fine reward for her, and I'll keep the horse. <laughs> the thief waited for the prince to disappear into the woods. Then he captured the princess, tied her up, and put her on the magic horse. He got on too and pulled the lever just like the prince had said, and the horse immediately rose into the air. The prince, still on the ground, in the woods, was surprised to hear the cries of his princess flying high overhead and he could do nothing about it. While the king was overjoyed to see his son and ordered a stay of execution for the toy maker, he understood why his son must leave again. The prince determined never to return until he had found his princess again. The Sultan of Kashmir was very impressed by the thief and delivered the reward. Then he escorted the princess to his palace. The next morning, he ordered his attendant to tell princess to get ready for the marriage on the same day. There was only one thing she felt she could do. She misbehaved and acted as though she were a crazy and spoiled princess. The Sultan was soon told of this strange development. He offered large rewards to any doctor who would cure her. Meanwhile, Prince Darius had been traveling through many countries uncertain which way to go because he didn't have his flying horse anymore. With nearly all hope gone, he rested on a rock. A few local farmers came by and told him about a princess who had gone mad at the day of her wedding to the Sultan of Kashmir. Suddenly, a flicker of hope lit the prince's heart. Could this be the same crazy princess he fell in love with? And he was determined to find out. Arriving at the capital city of Kashmir, he put on the clothes of a doctor. 
Then Prince Darius, disguised as the doctor, told the Sultan that indeed the princess could be cured, but he would need to speak with her alone. The Sultan agreed. As soon as the prince entered her room, he took her hands in his and whispered, It is I, Prince Darius, your beloved. This lab coat is merely a disguise. In more additional, superfluous, detailed whispers, the prince shared his plan with her. Then he returned to the Sultan. <clears throat> uh, your Majesty, Sultany Peppery, sir, there's a small chance I can save her and bring her back to sanity. You see, she must have touched something enchanted or watched too many movies as a child. Unless I can examine the magical item, I cannot cure her. The Sultan remembered the magic horse. He summoned the horse and showed it to the doctor. Upon seeing the horse, the doctor said, This is indeed the very magical object that enchanted the princess. <clears throat> let this horse be brought out into the square before the palace and let the princess be there. In a few minutes, she will be cured. The following morning, the magic horse was placed in the middle of the square. The prince, posing as a doctor, ordered torches placed around the horse for light. The princess was brought out and led to the horse. The pretend doctor placed her upon the horse. He then ran around it and threw magical black powder into the torches, which raised a cloud of smoke around the horse so that no one could see the princess and the horse. And hidden in the smoke, the prince mounted the horse, pulled the lever, and the magic horse rose into the air. Sultan! A bride's heart must be earned. It cannot be purchased. That same day, the Prince of Persia and his beloved princess arrived safely at the Persian court. The father rejoiced at the son's return and immediately ordered a great feast. And so the prince and princess lived happily ever after. And the toy maker too. The End The Magical Golden Crab Once upon a time, there was a fisherman and his wife named Jack and Ilsebil, who lived together in a filthy shack near the sea. Every day, the fisherman went out fishing. Once, he was sitting there fishing and looking into the clear water. His hook went to the bottom, deep down, and when he pulled it out, he had caught a large golden crab. The crab said to him, Listen, fisherman, I beg you to let me live. I'm not an ordinary golden crab. I'm special. I'm enchanted. Put me back into the water and let me swim. Well, you do look golden. But how do I know you're an enchanted crab? Dude, either I'm an enchanted talking crab, or you're losing your mind and talking to the wildlife. Well, that's a fair point. Maybe I am going crazy. Oh, but I guess if I am, there's no harm in letting you go, talking crab. With that, he put it back into the clear water, and the golden crab disappeared to the bottom. Then the fisherman got up and went home to his wife in the filthy shack. Jack! Did you catch anything today? No. I caught a golden crab, but he told me that he was an enchanted creature, so I let him swim away. Didn't you ask for anything first? No. What am I going to get from a talking crab? Well, how about a house? This awful shack is filthy and it stinks and I can see cracks in the roof. Go back and tell him that we want to have a little cottage. Wait, so a talking crab is like a genie in the lamp? I could just make wishes? I never knew that. Actually, I have no idea, but anytime you catch something golden and it talks, find out if it's one of those fairy tale things and ask it for something. The man did not want to go back outside. But he didn't want to argue either, so he went back to the sea. He yelled out to the waves. Crab, oh crab, in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife, good Ilsebil, 
I bring the wish, which you fulfill. The golden crab swam up and said, Dude, what are you talking about? Uh, my wife says she doesn't want to live in a filthy shack any longer. She would like to have a cottage. And you think asking a talking crab is going to improve your housing situation? Um, yeah, uh, like, I don't know, a, a, a wish? Okay, fine. Your wish is granted. Go home. The man went home, and his wife was standing in the door of a little cottage, and she said to him, Come in, see? Now isn't this much better? Ah, uh, yes, this is lovely. We can live here contentedly. Well, probably. We'll see. Everything went well for a week or two, and then the woman said, Listen, husband, this cottage is too small. The golden crab could have given us a larger house. I would like to live in a large stone palace. I go back to the golden crab and tell him to give us a palace. The man didn't feel right about asking the crab for something else, but he went anyway. He stood near the water and said, Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, here to me. For my wife named Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. Hello again, fisherman. What does she want now? Oh, my wife wants to live in a stone palace, said the man sadly. Go home. She'll be standing on the stone porch. Then the man went his way. When he arrived, standing there was a large stone palace. His wife was standing on the stairway about to enter. Taking him by the hand, she said, Come inside. Now, isn't this nice? Yes, this is quite enough. We can live in this beautiful palace and be satisfied. Uh, we'll see. Let's sleep on it. The next morning, the woman woke up and poked him in the side with her elbow and said, Husband, I cannot stand it any longer. Go to the golden crab and tell him I must become emperor. Oh, honey, I can't tell the golden crab to do that. There's only one emperor in the realm. What? If he can give me a palace, then he can make me emperor. Go there immediately. So he had to go. As he went on his way, the frightened man thought to himself, This is not going to end well. The golden crab is going to get tired of this. But he went anyway, and said again at the sea, Crab, oh crab in the sea, come. I pray here to me, for my wife, greedy Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want now? Oh, golden crab, my wife wants to become emperor. Go home, she's already emperor. Then the man went home, and when he arrived there, the entire palace was made of polished marble. He went inside, where his wife was sitting on a throne made of gold, and she was wearing a golden crown. When they went to bed, she was still not satisfied. Her greed would not let her sleep. She kept thinking what she wanted to become next. Then the sun was about to rise, and when she watched, she poked her husband with her elbow. Husband, I want to be in charge of the sun and moon, too. She looked at him so sternly that he shuddered. Go to Crab immediately. I want to become God. The fisherman fell on his knees before her. Elsa Bill, this has gone too far. I beg you, be satisfied and content where you are. Anger came over her. She kicked him with her foot and shouted, I cannot stand it any longer. Go there immediately. He ran away from his angry wife. 
Outside, such a storm was raging that he could hardly stand on his feet. The sky was as black as pitch. There was thunder and lightning. He cried again. Crab, oh crab in the sea, come, I pray, hear to me. For my wife, greedy Ilsebil, I bring the wish which you fulfill. What does she want then? Oh, she wants to become God. Go home. She is now God. Then the man went home, arriving there. Everything was gone like there was nothing in there ever before. And he can't see his wife anywhere. He hurried back to the crab and asked, Where's my wife? God is present here and everywhere. Nothing exists separate from the one God, because God is present everywhere. You can't see your wife, because now she is everywhere. The fisherman wept bitterly, and he asked for mercy. The fisherman had speared his life only once, but the golden crab felt bad for him. And he said, Now, I can fulfill your wish just once more, but ask wisely. Please, I want to see my wife happily standing at the door of our old shack. Go home. Your wish is granted. By saying this, the golden crab disappeared. And the fisherman went back to his home. And then he sees his wife standing in the door of his old shack with a pretty smile on her face. After this, she remained content and loved living together with her husband. And they lived happily ever after. The End Tit for Tat Once upon a time, there lived a man called Chester, who was very rich, but at the same time, as stingy and miserly as he could be. He had a housekeeper called Magda. In his young days, Chester had been one of the most active kids in the neighborhood. But as he grew old and stiff, he found it very difficult to walk, and his faithful servant urged him to get a horse. At last, Chester betook himself one day to the market, where he had seen a mule, and which he bought for seven gold pieces. Now, it happened that three thieves were hanging about the marketplace, who much preferred living off of other people's hard work instead of their own. As soon as they saw that Chester had bought a mule, one of them said to his two companions, My friends, this mule must be ours. But how shall we manage it? We must all three station ourselves at places along the old man's homeward way, and must each in his turn declare that the mule he has bought is a donkey. If we stick to our story, the mule will soon be ours. This plan quite satisfied the others, and they all split up to wait for him along his path. When Chester came by, the first thief said to him, God bless you, my fine gentleman. Ah, thanks for your courtesy. Where have you been? To the market. And what did you buy there? This mule. Which mule? The one I'm sitting upon. Are you in serious or only joking? What do you mean? Because it seems to me you got a hold of a donkey and not of a mule. A donkey? Rubbish. And without another word, he rode on his way. After a few hundred yards, he met the second thief, who addressed him. Good day, sir. Where are you coming from? From the market. Did things go pretty cheap? I should just think so. And did you make any good bargain for yourself? I bought this mule, upon which you see me. (laughs) But good heavens, it's nothing but a donkey. A donkey? You don't mean to say so. If a single another person tells me that, I'll have to get rid of this wretched animal. And he continued his way, and very soon met the third thief, who said to him, 
Oh, God bless you, sir. Are you any by chance coming from the market? Yes. Yes, I am. And what bargain did you drive there? I bought this mule upon which I am riding. A mule? <laughs> you can't be serious. Are you trying to make a fool of me? Uh, yes, I'm serious. Why would I joke about my mule? Oh, my poor friend. Can't you tell the difference between a mule and a donkey? You're the third person in the last two hours who has told me the same thing, but I wouldn't believe it. And dismounting from the mule, he spoke. Keep the animal. I'm embarrassed to have been duped at the market. The clever thief took the beast and rode on to join his fellow criminals, while Chester continued his journey on foot. As soon as the old man got home, he told his housekeeper that he had bought Donkey under the belief it was a mule and all the story till the end. Oh, dear sir, don't you see that they played a trick on you? They fooled you. They must be thieves. Uh, never mind. I will teach them a good lesson now. Then Chester bought two identical twin goats, paid as small a price for them, and leading them home with him, he told Magda to prepare a good meal, as he was going to invite some friends to dinner. He ordered her to roast some ham and to boil a pair of chickens, and told her to bake the best cake she could make. Then he took one of the goats and tied it to a post in the courtyard and gave it some grass to eat. Then he took the other goat and led it to the market. Just as soon as he had arrived, the three thieves saw him and decided to greet him. Welcome, Mr. Chester. What brings you here? I've come to get some provisions, because some friends are coming to dine with me today, and it would give me much pleasure if you were to honor me with your company also. The thieves willingly accepted this invitation, and Chester had made all his purchases. He tied them onto the goat's back and said to it, in the presence of the three con men, Go home now and tell Magna to roast the ham and boil the chickens and bake the best cake she can make. Now go fast, we will come on later. As soon as he untied his goat, it ran off as quickly as it could, and Chester walked with the three men for a while in the market, and then they all traveled to his home. When he and his guests entered the courtyard, they noticed the goat tied to the post quietly chewing the grass. They were astonished at this, for, of course, they thought it was the same goat that Chester had sent home loaded with provisions. As soon as they reached the house, Mr. Chester said to his housekeeper, Well, Magda, have you done what I told the goat to tell you to do? The clever woman understood her master and answered, Certainly I have. The ham is roasted and the chickens boiled. That's all right. When the three rogues saw the cooked meats and the cake in the oven and heard Magda's words, they were amazed and began to consult at once how they were to get the goat into their possession. At last, towards the end of the meal, one of them said to Chester, My worthy host, you must sell your goat to us. Chester replied that he was most unwilling to part with the creature, as no amount of money could make up to him for its loss. Still, if they were quite set on it, he would let them have the goat for 50 gold pieces. The thieves paid the 50 gold pieces at once and left the house quite happily, leading the goat with them. When they got home, they said to their wives, Don't cook the dinner tomorrow until we send a messenger home. The following day, they went to the market and bought chickens, and after they had packed them on the back of the talking goat, they told it all the meals they wished their wives to prepare. As soon as the goat was untied, it ran as quickly as it could. When the dinner hour approached, all three went home and asked their wives for the dinner. Oh, you fools and blockheads! How could you ever believe for a moment that a goat would do the work of a servant maid? You've been finally deceived for what you've done with others. This is what they call tit for tat. The End The Almighty's Conditions Thousands of years ago, a mighty god lived among all the living creatures. He had not yet created humans. The rabbit was the most talented creature at that time. One day, 
Rabbit visited the god at his palace, which is also in the jungle. It is a pleasure having you in my palace. What can I do for you? Almighty deity, you have control over everybody and everything in this forest. You are a true master. I need a favor. What kind of favor? Just one thing. Please make me wise and intelligent. Well, well, well. Everyone wants to be rich, and you're asking me to make you smarter. Why? Because I want to be more intelligent than all the animals in the forest. Hmm, fine. But you'll have to show me what you're capable of, because I was thinking of making a separate species and granting them wiseness and intelligence. If you prove to me that you're capable, then I will cancel my plans for the creation of humans. What do you think, hmm? I'll do whatever is necessary. If you can get me five blue birds, five white butterflies, a bee as big as you, then I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> I'll get them. I won't fail. In the forest, Rabbit enters looking tired. He sits on the floor beside a pond. All kinds of animals enter and start drinking water from the pond. Then they leave. Five bluebirds enter and drink water from the pond. Then they start playing and jumping. <laughs> Today I'll know what I'm capable of. No, it can't be. It's not possible. That's not true. I cannot believe it. No, they are not that many. The five bluebirds approach him. Hey, rabbit, what are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Oh, someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> are you kidding? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five bluebirds laugh and dance around the rabbit. Great! <laughs> five white butterflies enter and start drinking honey from flowers by the pond. Wow, those are the most beautiful butterflies I have ever seen. <laughs> but, but no, I don't think they can do that. That would be impossible. <laughs> what am I thinking? The five white butterflies approach him. Hey, Rabbit, what are you talking about? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell us what's wrong. Uh, well, someone told me that you could come with me. But I know that's just impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're not serious, right? We never get tired. We always fly long distances. Flying doesn't make us feel tired. We can go with you wherever you go. The five white butterflies laugh and dance around the rabbit. <laughs> Great! A big bee enters and drinks honey from a flower. What a beautiful bee. But no, I don't think she can do it. That would be impossible. <laughs> I must be crazy. The bee approaches him. Hey, rabbit. What are you talking about? What's the matter? It's nothing. It's just impossible. Please, tell me what's wrong. <laughs> Someone told me that you could come with me, but I know that is impossible. You would get tired of the trip. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, you, you couldn't. I never get tired. I always travel long distances. <laughs> Perfect. Let's go, everybody. Yeah. 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 Hey, wait. 
You haven't told us where we're going. That's a big surprise. <laughs> Is it good or bad? Oh, good, of course. Come on, before it gets dark. At the God's Palace, the rabbit, five bluebirds, five white butterflies, and the huge bee stand before the God. I was waiting for you. The God was looking at the five birds, five butterflies, and the bee. I see you brought to the company. Will you grant my wish now? I don't think so. Why not? If I make you more intelligent, I would be making a big mistake. How come? Because you are already very intelligent. Then, am I more intelligent than the other animals in the forest? You've always been smart, but you didn't know it. What is your wish? They all start talking at the same time. Rabbit leaves the palace, walking out triumphantly. The End A Bizarre Witch A long time ago, King Arthur of England was hunting in the Forbidden Kingdom, but the kingdom's soldiers found him. Stop! You are not allowed to hunt in the Forbidden Kingdom. That's why we call it Forbidden. Who gave you permission to be here? Nobody. Then you come with us. We will take you to King Marcus, the king of the Forbidden Kingdom. When King Marcus saw him, he said, You look like a smart guy, but the penalty for entering the Forbidden Kingdom is amputation of limb. Uh, okay, uh, wait, what? Amputation? I didn't even see a no trespassing sign. Actually, he was trespassing and hunting, my king. Oh, I see. In that case, the penalty is death. You seem like a nice guy, and you look pretty good with your limbs, so I will forgive you on one condition. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay, what do you want? Go back to your kingdom, and I will give you one year to find out the answer to a very difficult question. Oh, <sighs> Okay, no problem. I have a think tank university back at my castle. They solve all types of questions. So, do you want to know the question? Mm, yes, I do. Wait. Uh, okay. Yes, I'm ready. The question is... What do women want? Who? Oh, uh... Hmm. Wow. Maybe we could revisit the left arm idea? You have one year, then we take your arm, then we take your life. That's an impossible question to answer. Not even the wisest man in my kingdom would have an answer to your question, but I guess it's worth a try. See you in a year. You are free to go, and don't forget, I've been waiting for you. King Arthur returned to his kingdom and started questioning everybody. The princess, the queen, the priests, the wise men, but no one had an answer. Then, he asked one of his maids. Well, people say there's a witch living in the deep forest who knows the answer to any question. Why don't you go and ask her? Whoa, that's weird. Why would a witch know? I really don't know. But she's a woman, and you seem to have asked everyone else in the kingdom. So, maybe it's worth a try. What is she charge? Less than a limb? Uh, a limb? Probably less. Kind of hard to tell with inflation and currency exchange. Well, if she has the answer, then I gotta have it. I like my limbs. Just don't go alone. Take your soldiers with you. She's not a very pleasant person. Ah, uh, I will. Thanks for the advice. That same night, King Arthur went to the old witch's house. And just as he was about to knock, the witch opened the door. I've been expecting you. I know that your time is running out. Oh, well, if you already know why I'm here, then just tell me the answer. Are you willing to pay the price? Name your price. I've just got to do what i got to do. So, you would accept the deal? Uh, yeah, sure. Then it's a deal. 
I want to marry Sir Gawain, your best friend. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Makes me sick just to think of the idea of you marrying him. You accepted the price, don't you remember? Have you seen yourself in a mirror? You're ugly! Uh, you only have one tooth and you're hunchbacked. You're the most repulsive person I've ever seen. How can I ask my best friend to sacrifice because of me? Talk to him. I know that you will come back. King Arthur had no choice but to talk to his friend. It is okay, my king. Marrying such an ugly witch is worth it to save your limbs. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Gwen. <laughs> I guess I should call you my right-hand man, since you're saving my limb and all. Tell her I accept and prepare everything. The wedding shall be tomorrow. You'll cover the bill, right? King Arthur returned to the witch's house. I will be ready. Tomorrow, after the wedding, you will have your answer. When the wedding papers were signed, the witch said, What a lady wants is to be valued. Everybody at the wedding was astonished that King Arthur had made such a deal, even the women. But they hoped that King Arthur would now be safe from King Marcus. And King Arthur made plans to travel to the Forbidden Kingdom to deliver his answer. Meanwhile, at the wedding, Gwen was respectful and kind to the witch. But the guests, who were noblemen and maidens, had their own opinions. Look at the way she eats. I feel ashamed just to look at her. Why does she have to eat with her bare hands? If we have spoons... Are you listening to the noise she makes when she eats, or is it just my imagination? Poor Gwen. He's so handsome. He's truly a good friend. Indeed he is. Later that night, Gwen was alone in his room when the door opened, and he saw a beautiful young lady. Who, 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 who are you? I am your wife. My wife? Well, what kind of joke is this? It's not a joke. It is me. Long ago, people's cruel words cursed me to appear ugly and repulsive. But your kindness has revealed my beauty again. But you're gorgeous. What's happened to you? You treated me with kindness and showed me that I was valuable and protected. So, half of the time, I will look horrible. And the other half, I will be beautiful, as you see me right now. Huh. Wow. I'm speechless. Is there any way you could just be beautiful all the time? No. You must decide which half of the day I am beautiful, and which half I will be ugly. Shall I be beautiful in public, or beautiful when I am with you, alone? Hmm... Let me think. I'll let you know my decision in a few hours. Call me when you are ready. I will. When the witch left the room, Gwen went on to the garden near the castle just to think about what to do. Hmm, what should I do? What should I do? I should surely want an adorable young lady during the day for everybody else to see, especially my friends. At night, I would like a beautiful girl and not a horrible witch. Or should I prefer the opposite? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. After a few minutes, Gwen made a decision, went back to the castle, and straight to his room, where his wife was already waiting. What is your answer? Milady, I cannot decide. The people at our wedding said so many unkind things about you. I wish I could teach them a lesson and show up during the daytime with a gorgeous bride at my side. But then again, I don't need their approval about who I should love. I don't care what they say, but I do care about what they say about you, though. So perhaps it is best if you could be beautiful in public so they won't hurt your feelings. But then I will appear to be ugly when I am alone with you. Yes, but... That will not stop me from loving you, my wife. I will be content knowing that others can see your outward beauty, and I know you are beautiful on the inside. Oh, Gwen, I was hoping you would say that. The curse upon me will now be completely gone, because you have chosen to love me and value me whether I am beautiful or not. 
and that you would rather give up your own happiness to protect me than to see me come to harm. Now I will be beautiful for you all the time. And they lived happily ever after. And the king got to keep his arm. He was happy about that too. The End The Magical Apple Tree Once upon a time, in the world of fairies and kings, lived a selfish man named Toon, who had three daughters, the eldest of whom was named Mono, because she had but a single eye. The second was called Stereo, because she was common, and the third, Dolby, because she had three eyes. But because her second sister was common in her appearance, she was looked down upon by her sisters and despised by her father. They gave her coarse clothing and nothing to eat but their leftovers. Once, it happened that Stereo had to go into the forest to take care of their goat, and she went very hungry because her sisters had given her very little to eat that morning. She sat down upon a hill and cried. Then there came a good witch and said, Why are you weeping, Stereo? Because I have two eyes like ordinary people. Therefore my father and sisters don't like me and give me hardly anything to eat. Today they have given me so little that I am still hungry. I will transform your goat into a magical goat. Then every time you say to your little black goat, Little goat, give me some beet. Give me food which I can eat. And immediately the goat will start dance and a table filled with lovely food will stand before you, of which you can eat as much as you please. And when you are satisfied, you must say, Little goat, stop now, please. My tummy is full. Close the treat. With these words, the witch went away. And Stereo sings, Little goat, give me some beet. Give me food which I can eat. And immediately, the black goat started her dance, and a table with the most delicate and rare foods were appear upon it. Stereo began to eat, and when she had finished, she said, Little goat, stop now, please. My tummy is full. Close the treat. And everything quickly disappeared. When evening fell, she went home with her goats and found an earthen dish which her sisters had left her, filled with their leftovers. She did not touch it. The first and second time she did this, the sisters thought nothing of it. But when she did the same the third morning, they became curious, and they said, all is not right with Stereo, for she has left her meals twice and has touched nothing of what was left for her. She must have found some other way of living. So they determined that Mono should go with the maiden when she drove the goat to the meadow and pay attention to what passed and observe whether anyone brought her to eat or to drink. When Stereo was about to set off, Mono told her she was going with her to see whether she took proper care of the goat. Stereo, however, figured out what her sister was up to and drove the goat where the grass was finest and then said, Come sit down and I will sing to you. So Mono sat down, for she was quite tired with her unusual walk and the heat of the sun. Stereo sang nicely until her sister went to sleep. As soon as she was in a deep sleep, the maiden had her table out and ate and drank all she needed. And by the time Mono woke again, the table had disappeared, and the maiden said to her, Come, we will go home now. So they went home, and after Stereo had left her meal untouched, the father inquired of Mono what had seen, and she confesses that she had been asleep. The following morning... The father told Dolby to follow her sister, Stereo. So Dolby told her sister that she was going to accompany her that morning. But Stereo saw through her thoughts and drove the goat again to the best feeding place. Then she asked her sister to sit down 
and she would sing to her, and Dolby did so. Then Stereo began to sing as before. By and by, Dolby closed two of her eyes, and went to sleep with them, but the third eye kept open. Dolby, however, cunningly shut it too, and pretend to be asleep, while she was watching. And soon, Stereo, thinking all safe, repeated the magic words. Dolby watched all the proceedings, and afterward, Stereo came and awoke her, saying, "Let's go home now." When they reached home, her sister told her father she knew now why Stereo would not eat their remaining food. Then the father, with his fury, took a carving knife and killed the goat. As soon as Stereo saw this, she went out very sorrowful to the old spot, and wept bitterly. All at once, the good witch stood in front of her again, and asked why she was crying. She told her everything. Stereo, beg your sisters to give you the innards of the goat. And bury them in the earth before the house door, and your fortune will be made. So saying, she disappeared, and Stereo went home, and said to her sisters, "Dear sisters, do give me some part of the slain goat. I desire nothing else. Let me have the innards." The sisters foolishly gave them to her, and she buried them secretly before the door. The following morning, they found in front of the house a wonderfully beautiful tree, with leaves of silver and apples of gold hanging from the branches. As soon as the father saw it, he told Mano to break off some of the apples. Mano went up to the tree and pulled a branch toward her to pluck off the fruit, but the branch flew back again directly out of her hands, and so it did. Every time she took hold of it, till she was forced to give up. Then the father sent Dolby to do it, but the same thing happened. At last, the father got so impatient that he climbed the tree himself. But he was met with no more success than either of his daughters. Stereo now thought she would try, so Stereo climbed the tree, and right away touched the branch. And the golden apples fell into her hands. She filled her apron with them. Her father took them all from her. One morning, the three sisters were all standing together beneath it, when in the distance, a young knight was seen riding toward them. Go away, Stereo. We don't want to have to be embarrassed by you. And they put over her an empty barrel which stood nearby. And which covered some golden apples as well. Soon, the knight came up to the tree. He stopped to admire the magical tree, and presently asked to whom it belonged, for he should like to have a branch off it. Mano and Dolby replied that the tree belonged to them, and they tried to pluck a branch off for the knight, but the branches and fruit flew back as soon as they touched them. This is very strange that this tree should belong to you, and yet you cannot pluck the fruit. While they spoke, Stereo rolled a golden apple from underneath the barrel, so that it traveled to the feet of the knight. When he saw the apple, he was astonished and asked where it came from. And Mano and Dolby said they had another sister, but they dared not let her be seen. The knight, however. Would see her, and called. Hey, you! Come here. And soon, Stereo made her appearance from under the barrel. The knight was baffled at her great beauty, and said, "Oh my! You have a beauty which I have never seen before. Will you marry me? I can fulfill any wish you want." Yes, I will marry you. And yes, I have one condition: if you take me with you. For here, I suffer, hunger, and thirst, and am in trouble and grief from early morning to late evening. Take me and save me. Upon hearing that, the knight raised Stereo upon his saddle and took her home to his father's castle. 
and afterward, he married her. And a very happy wedding they had. The tree still belongs to Stereo, and no one else could ever touch it or cut it. The End End